from the Gospel of Luke, uh, begins chapter 19 and verse 28. And Jesus is coming to Jerusalem as king. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany, at a hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you'll find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you why you're untying it, say the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owner asked them, Why are you untying the colt? And they replied, The Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. And as he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they'd seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. This is the word of the Lord. Uh, our second reading is from the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, and Jesus is returned, risen, about to ascend. And Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. This is the word of the Lord. Let's just pray. King Jesus, help us to hear your words of commission in our lives. And then through your Holy Spirit, help equip us and empower us to undertake the commission you give us. Amen. Well, I actually delight in those moments when I uh, look at a very familiar passage and see new insights, at least new to me. Uh, and today's Palm Sunday reading uh, from Luke's Gospel gave rise to just such a moment of delight. So yes, this passage is about Jesus. It's about his triumphal entry into Jerusalem riding on a colt, a baby donkey. And yes, this is passage is about Jesus fulfilling a prophecy from Zechariah. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem, see your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle, and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And yes, this is about Jesus being proclaimed king. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. And yes, we too, can join in and celebrate with praise as we remember this moment, as we should. And the title we often give to this event is Jesus' Triumphal Entry. And perhaps that title should be understood with some irony. In those days and in that culture, a victorious king or a general would return to his home, home city in triumph. He, and it would almost always be a he, would be riding an impressive and probably white war horse. In his procession would be not only victorious soldiers, but the booty of war, the treasures, the captives, the future slaves that would boost the local economy with their forced labor. And if they had survived, the conquered rulers to be publicly humiliated and then executed. By dramatic contrast, Jesus' triumphal entry is on a baby donkey, a colt. His sandaled feet were probably scraping the ground, kicking up dust as he rides. Jesus carries no weapons, except perhaps the truth. He comes in victory not over people, but over sin and death. 
And yet his victory is still to be won. The cross is yet to come. But as he comes, his disciples lift up praise and thanksgiving and give glory to God. But all that said, today, our subject is the final of our current series, Christ the Commissioner. Jesus' victory will be won through humility, through love, through service, and the army that he commissions us, that army is called to follow his example. And as we'll learn on Maundy Thursday, when we read once again of how he washed his disciples' feet as an example for us to follow. We're part of that army. He's commissioned it, us, each one of us, to engage the enemy in truth, in humility, in love, in service. And that's the essence of our second Bible reading from Matthew, the Great Commission. In Matthew's Gospel reading, we find Jesus victorious, now risen from, de from the dead. Here we hear about his kingly authority given to him by his Father in heaven. All authority, he says, in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go. There's no greater authority anywhere, ever. Not even the most callous and vengeful tyrant, and you can add your own name there somewhere, choose your favorite tyrant, has greater authority than the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, all are subject to his judgment. And that would be absolutely terrifying if it were not for the baby donkey. This Jesus, at whose word creation sprang into being, came humbly, gently riding on a donkey. Jesus' triumphal entry is the physical embodiment of James's declaration that mercy triumphs over judgment. And despite all of his power and authority, this, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, commissions us. He commissions us to be his hands and his feet, his ears and his eyes, his heart and compassion on earth. He calls us to be his followers, his disciples, to do what he would do and to say what he would say. What complete humility and vulnerability, what complete trust he expresses as he directs us with that great commission, go and make disciples of all nations. He's chosen to leave this great work in our hands. Well, fortunately, unlike many military commanders, Jesus knows the end from the beginning. He knows that despite our weaknesses and our failures, God's plan will prevail. When he commissions us, he knows ahead of time what the outcome will be. Yet he wants us to be involved, to be on his team, to be his disciples, to do what he would do, to say what he would say. So let's look again at that account of Jesus' triumphal entry, but this time through the perspective of Jesus the Commissioner. Let's see what we can learn as we watch and follow Jesus' disciples. Well, firstly, I don't think the disciples had any clue at all as to what this was all about when he told them to go ahead to the next village and fetch that baby donkey. I don't think they realized that this would be the fulfillment of Zechariah's prophecy. I think they'd have been wondering, what on earth does he want a donkey for? It's only half a day's walk to Jerusalem. I don't think they would have realized that God had already predisposed the owner of the donkey to say yes when he heard that the Lord wanted it. That that owner was at heart also a disciple listening to God's promptings. After all, I don't think Jesus could have sent a WhatsApp ahead of himself. 
But God knows the end from the beginning. So despite not being able to see the big picture, the disciples simply obeyed. They did what was asked of them. And perhaps there's something here to learn about the nature of discipleship. I imagine when they saw the donkey and started to untie it, they were worried about what the owner would say. They gave him Jesus' words, and that, that was enough. Was this a gracious reassurance for the disciples? Were they being encouraged that things would actually pan out just as Jesus had said? And these simple acts of obedience to fetch the donkey, to release the donkey, were the simple preludes to something so amazing, so wonderful, that it must have blown their minds. Try and imagine how they would have felt as they told these events to their grandchildren in later years, saying, I was there, I was part of it. Out of these simple acts of obedience, God produced something unimaginably greater, unimaginably more wonderful. The crowds came together and recognized their king, their Messiah. They gave such resounding praise and thanksgiving. The disciples were rewarded in ways beyond their reckoning. Just think of any other times when Jesus commissioned his disciples to do something. The feeding of the 5,000, the sending of the 72, the lowering of nets after a fruitless night's fishing. The list could go on and on. In every case, the disciples were asked to do something simple, even if inexplicable. And the result of their obedience was out of all proportion to their effort. And so we come to Jesus' great commission, how he has commissioned us to go and make disciples of all nations. Now this word go, it's not ascending abroad, although for some it might well be. The word go is in the present continuous tense. So it means as you're going, or whatever you're doing, make disciples on the way. Our whole lives, our relationships, our hobbies, our careers, our families and friends, these are all the context in which we're called to make disciples. Whenever, wherever, whoever, make disciples. And Jesus then adds a little more detail the how. We're to go baptizing and teaching. To go in the confident promise and awareness that Jesus himself will be with us to the very end of the age. In other words, until this work on earth is completed. And everything else is incidental. All the liturgies, all the rites, all the buildings, all the volunteering, all the songs and hymns of praise, all our generous giving, all of this is incidental, unless, unless it's contributing to the commission we've been given, unless it helps us to make disciples right here in Bookham. We have been commissioned by the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So let's go do his work in our generation. Let's build faith in our community and see what wonders Christ the Commissioner works through our obedience. Amen. And we're going to speak to Greg and Sophie Sangwine. Do we have Sophie? Yes, we do. <laughs> yes. If you don't know Greg and Sophie, their mum, Greg's mum is Ali Sangwine there, and Sophie is her daughter-in-law. Do you want to come up here? Uh, how about this one? Oh. It's already on. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for having us. Uh, I'm going to stand this side so most of you can see me. Um, uh, thank you uh, for welcoming us today and having us as part of your service. My wife's family have been involved in ministry in Zimbabwe since 2007. And they've been traveling out particularly to work with the children in Zimbabwe. And in 2012, we had the opportunity to move there to partner with the local church in opening a preschool. 
And to cut a very long story short, that preschool became a primary school and educates 250 students at the moment and is run by local people and the local church. And this church community have been involved with the ministry in Zimbabwe since my mum became part of this church in 2014. And this church community has helped establish a community library in, uh, at One Way School in Zimbabwe. You've helped to build additional classrooms for that school. You've helped to send uh, adults to school to become teachers and for their own education. And you've helped establish a medical fund where we've been able to pay for the medical care of adults and students and the local community. So you've been a part of that ministry through us uh, for quite a while now. And um, Sophie and I continue to be pulled to Zimbabwe. We continue to hear from God and continue to feel as if our hearts are with that nation and particularly the children of that nation. And what we'll be doing in the next uh, few weeks is moving back to Zimbabwe to partner with a foundation. And this foundation has a very special mission. This foundation would like to establish a homeschool environment for children with additional needs. And what the Lord has been providing for Sophie and I in the last few years has been training in Lewisham, where we have been working in a uh, mainstream primary school, but specifically teaching children with a diagnosis of autism. And what we believe is that uh, the Lord is calling us to share the knowledge that he has given us and trained us, and we'll be hoping to do that with as many students and continuing to train adults in Harare. And um, we'd like to invite you to continue to be with us. And thank you for praying with us, and thank you to God for the things that are already in place and the knowns that we already have. But I don't think that this is a coincidence that we're here on Palm Sunday to talk to you about this today, because I'm sure that Jesus, being the human man that he was, was feeling all the feelings on the first Palm Sunday. I'm sure he was feeling nervous and worried but also excited. And my wife and I and our children are feeling all the feelings as we follow what we believe to be the Lord's calling on our life. We're excited, but we're nervous and we're sad to be leaving family and friends behind. But what I don't believe God asks us to do is easy things. I believe what God asks us to do is things that God believes that we're capable of doing with his strength behind us. And opening a home school for children with additional needs in a broken economy like Zimbabwe seems to be an impossible mission. However, with the people of God behind us and with the love and the guidance of the Lord, we know that his plans will always be victorious. And we know from our past life, we know from one-way school and the blessing that it is to its community that the Lord's work will forever shine out and be victorious. Greg, can, can I just ask you to tell us what it will be like when, when you get there and how it's different from here? Oh my goodness, I need a lot more than five, I need a lot more than a few seconds. <laughs> In a nutshell. Um, there, 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 there's, there's um, oh my goodness, what's similar about Zimbabwe to the UK? I mean, Zimbabwe is a Christian nation. I mean, going to Zimbabwe, 90% of uh, Zimbabweans attend church on Sundays. It's a beautiful place where people love to be in church and uh, it's, and um, that's, that's certainly a difference because we'd love our church to be full of the people of Bookham, but the truth <laughs> is that our churches are sparsely populated compared to our communities and uh, yeah, that's a huge difference. But actually access to education is not free in any part of Zimbabwe, access to healthcare is not free in any parts of Zimbabwe, access to anything is very, very difficult in Zimbabwe and um, uh, yeah, life expectancy is lower. Um, it's more difficult to be there. It's, um, it's, a, it's a place where, um, how can I put this? Um, people have a hard time. 
it would, would be the polite way of putting it. People have a difficult life out there. However, what do people do in Zimbabwe? They appreciate every little thing that they have. And every little thing that they're given, they believe to be a blessing that God has given them. And what's different to their culture, to ours? When we, I will forever be reminded of the second week I lived in Zimbabwe. And a man stood up and he was sharing the tragic news of the death of his wife. At which point he thanked God for his marriage and thanked God for the time that he spent with his wife. I was sat there incredibly challenged in my second week living there, thinking, would I, as a human being, blame God for the death of my wife, or would I thank God for the life that he'd had with his wife? And to sum up what Zimbabwe is like, that's the faith of a Zimbabwean. And that is the people that we are partnering with, and that is the people that we want to serve. Brilliant. It's wonderful. If, Did you want yeah. to say something? If I start talking, it'll go longer than five minutes. Okay. <laughs> maybe, maybe. So, so if it, will you be around afterwards? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, if you'd like to ask any more questions, I wanted to know how hot it was. <laughs> uh, hot. <laughs> maybe over coffee, you, you could uh, uh, come up and, and ask the questions, because the children are going as well. They haven't been for a while, so there's lots to ask. And of course, we've always got Ali here to keep us in touch. Please send us your prayer requests and keep in touch. We're right behind Thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate Thank that. Thank you. And thank you, everyone. I'm going to put my palm cross here where we can all see it. Hopefully. So first, I want to do the collect for today, for Palm Sunday. True and humble King, hailed by the crowd as Messiah, Grant us the faith to know you and love you, that we may be found beside you on the way of the cross, which is the path of glory. Amen. So as we come now to pray, Father, let us pray. Almighty Father, we celebrate today the way how in such humility your son Jesus Christ travelled into Jerusalem on a donkey as the crowd strew his way with palms and welcome him. We pray for the journey of faith answering your call which Greg and Sophie are making to return to Zimbabwe. We thank you that their visas have been granted and they can make all the preparations still needed to be done. We give thanks for the accommodation and the work ready for them as they say farewell to family and friends. We pray especially for their children, Jack and Abby, as they leave their friends here that they will be comforted and look with anticipation on their new life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. <clears throat> Father, Christian solidarity worldwide tirelessly work gaining and receiving inf information from around the world of individuals and churches persecuted for their faith and taking action on that information. So as we go through the week leading up to Easter, remembering firstly Jesus' arrest, we pray for those who are unjustly arrested, particularly Pastor Keshav Acharya in Nepal, Pastor Lorenzo in Cuba, and Pastor Nadakani and others in Iran. Remembering how Pilate was under pressure to convict Jesus, we pray for those under pressure to deny their faith, especially Christians in Sudan 
and, and Nigeria in order to gain their freedom or safety. On the cross, Jesus suffered alone for us, and we pray for Christians in many countries who are often targeted and feel abandoned or alone. We pray that they may feel the hope of a gospel afresh at this Easter time. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We give thanks for our King Charles and pray for him in, his, in this time leading up to his coronation. We pray for his relationship with our, governor, our government and ask, Lord, that they will all work wisely to deal with all the ongoing problems of this country, particularly with strikes, poverty and homelessness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Within our church here in the heart of Bookham, we pray for our rector, Alan, who is unwell at this time, and ask for a speedy, full recovery for him. We give thanks for our church wardens working tire tirelessly, mainly in the background, to ensure the smooth running of our church and pray that new people will be led to come forward to join that team as we come up to our annual meeting. We give thanks for all the work of Celeste in families and children's ministry, particularly thinking of the event on, Christmas, on Easter sun, Saturday and events in the celebration week to encourage families and children to attend. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. So, Father, we lift you all those. Li Sorry. Living in the, all those living in the paddocks, and for any concerns and cares each have as they pray, as as we pray too for those named on our news sheet for their illness, joys, and relationships. We pray for those we reach each name in the quiet now for their illnesses and concerns. You know each one of them, Father. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We join now together in the words of the prayer Jesus taught us on page nine in your service books and, yes, on the overhead. <laughs> our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Amen.